Hey everybody, welcome to Deep Fat Fried. We're your hosts. Uh... <laughs> I'm going Super Saiyan. Ah! It didn't work. That's Paul's exercise for the week. More like Super Gayin. <laughs> Paul, you need, you need a minute. We need to pause. The, uh, Can we start recording? again? I need to fucking lay down and take a nap after that, man. I think I almost Paul went Paul used Saiyan. all of his show energy in one foul All of my burst. life energy, I felt it drain into another source, and I got scared, and I pulled back at the last second. I think I was about to go Super Saiyan, guys. Oh, were you, Paul? But Paul, you know what? Just because uh, I was hyped I hate, to be here. I hate to nitpick, dude, but usually they're drawing energy from the things around them. Not just from within themselves, so that's kind of strange. Well, maybe so. that's where you draw your, but I'm a different kind of super Those, stand. Well, you know what? The Kamehameha is not the most powerful attack in Dragon Ball Z. It's actually the Spirit Bomb, Paul. Which yeah, but the draw. Spirit Bomb takes forever. I Whatever. think I that's almost the ultimate set one attack, of those dude. off in here just it, now. How is it the ultimate attack when it failed to defeat Frieza, dude? Yeah. It did injure him greatly, though. It, it injured did, him. It did hurt him. And that's, out, that's actually how they defeat Majin Buu. Yeah, but I, that doesn't make yeah. sense. How the fuck you not kill Frieza with a spirit bomb, but Majin Buu, who's way stronger than Frieza? This Dragon Ball Z doesn't really make any sense. No, nothing it's in a, Dragon Ball Z. It's makes a show sense. where it's all like, will Frieza be defeated? Dude, in I swear episode, to fucking Frieza God. Frieza defeated. A lot of times when I watch that show, I just got the sense of like they're just making this up as they go, aren't they? I think it was because the manga was so it was so close with the anime that it was like they had to just. They had, I know they had out. to do a bunch of filler. Isn't that why they did, they did an abridged streak? That's why they did yeah. like the whole long snake way thing and all kinds of shit. Why are we talking about DBZ? I don't know. Because I just tried to go Super Saiyan That's at the true. top of the show. But didn't they come nasty. out with an abridged Can you imagine DBZ, if though? I would have gone Super Saiyan, how amazing the show would have been tonight? If um, my beard had will... just turned golden and flowing and I was just <laughs> like, ha, 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 All right. I will grant you that it would be cool if you went Super Saiyan. It would be amazing if I went Super Saiyan, TJ. No, I'd be moderately neato. Moderately neato? Yeah, moderately You'd neato. be the first <laughs> recipient neato? of my power attack, TJ. <laughs> Paul, I'm already, I would, I would I'm fucking, already a Super Saiyan. I would Look, I'm already blonde. That's all you the, need. The punch of a thousand fists on your face and see how you, see if you thought it was funny. <laughs> all right, let's see which one of us can actually pull off a, a Kamehameha attack then. Oh, okay, you want to have a Kamehameha off? Yeah. All right. It's a, yeah, let's you do it. You go first. Challenger goes first. I got to go first? Yeah, hit me with the Kamehameha. All right, let's see. All right, I'm gonna ju- I'm gonna judge this shit, dude. I see who's better. Because I mean, I, I have seen. I've Don't be much screaming seen, right into the mic to fucking. I, and, and I've pretty much seen every shit. Kamehameha in DBZ history. <clears> so, <throat> well, this isn't about who can yell it the loudest. This is about no. who can actually summon forth a burst of energy to attack the let's other see. person with. And right. I, and I want that's the criteria. And I want you to shoot me with it, TJ, too. So I'm ready. All right. Well, you'll both obviously be in the path. So, I am going to summon forth uh, the energy. I guess. Of what? Of uh, the universe. I don't know. The universe. Where where do the what, where do they get the come? Is it from within or is it from without? Like the spirit bomb. How's that work? I think I think that's that's something they generate themselves. That's, that's from within. Yeah. All right. Okay. So I gotta get. <sighs> got, they have to be saying the words right. at the right I'm time. I'm gonna turn too. to face you, TJ. To all right, receive all right, your TJ. Blow. You receive my blow. <laughs> yeah. All right, all right. Receive his load. I'll make it easy for you. Hold TJ. on. Hold on. I'm gonna. Let me unzip oh, no, my I fly. Okay. Come on, TJ. We're ready. All right, I'm doing it. Shut up. It's not easy. All right. <sighs> Give it to me. <sighs> Come I thought, I don't know, man. Was I summoning it from the wrong place? I was you, trying to bring it from my heart. Maybe I should have done it from my enough. balls. You didn't reach deep enough. DJ. I didn't reach it deep felt, enough. Reach well, deep today enough. it felt rushed. I guess it was kind of naive to think I could just Let nail it on my first done. shot. Let All right. me show you how it's done. Okay. okay. You ready? You ready, TJ? Yeah, I'm ready. Fuck, dude. <clears throat> I don't even have to put on the big show you did. Harness my, harness my key. Oh, you, this is unfair. He's done it before. Hame, Hame, Ha! Got 
Got you, bitch. You just threw a can at me. I manifested yes, a can from my Wow. Key. What the fuck, <laughs> I mean, dude? it's better than I did. Got him. Got him. I'm pretty sure he just palmed a can and threw nah, it at me. I did not. Uh-uh. I manifested a can I, I with the power no of my key. I saw no can wow. before, TJ. What about you, Scotty? What you got? Oh, I can't even do it, dude. I can't even try it. You're not even going to try? I'm he fucking, hasn't trained dude, I'm, in the I'm, Super Saiyan I'm, I'm Krillin, dude. <laughs> okay. Yeah, he's the human. You're the Krillin of the group. Yeah, yeah. dude, I'm just Krillin. I'm just chilling. I'm Why not Krillin. TN? I'd have picked I wanna TN. Be, I want to be Krillin, dude. All right. Now, Scotty right. should at least be Krillin. You don't have to be TN. Come TN's on. pretty fucking amazing. Well, maybe in Dragon Gee, Ball. Gee, guys, I don't know about that. <sighs> TN can do that try attack thing. Anyway, let's... Let's cover tonight's uh, topic, Dragon, Dragon Ball, Ball Z, Z, bitch. Yeah. All right. So, the, you know, I, I think we all have films, and I, I put this out to the audience too. I know, by the way, some of you guys are sick of too many movie episodes. This will be the There's last too many movies. The last week of that. Oh, and I should mention that we're actually doing two episodes today. Uh, because a lot of you guys out there have told us that you wanted us to do another Super Bowl commercials thing, which we weren't even planning on doing, but because just, just so many people want it, we're going to go ahead and do it, but it's going to be only for patrons, so... We give yep. it to you. Patrons Extra get it. The rest episode. of you guys, you don't get it. Sorry. Sorry. Become patrons. It's not that hard. Yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, we are going to do a Super Bowl commercial one, uh, but the topic we want to do is uh, we all have guilty pleasure movies. Movies that, uh, you know... Maybe they're not so great, according to most people, but maybe they got a soft spot in our hearts, and we want to talk about some of those. And uh, before we get into the official ones, do you guys, either you guys have any runners-up or movies that you thought about doing, but you didn't for some reason? Um, all the other ones that came to my mind are kind of minor cult classics now. Right. So, not really. I mean, these are... I, I do have. There are probably a few more that are pretty shitty that would, you know, probably make it onto this list. I'll but. tell you. Yeah, I'll I tell mean, you two I considered if okay. you want. Sure, um, go sure. for it. I considered uh, the movie uh, Death Stalker. Yeah. But when I thought about it, I'm like, there's really no way I could defend this as being good. It's just really fucking terrible. But I I enjoy it, you know. Right. Uh, the other one I was thinking about doing was The Room, which, of course, is a huge cult classic yeah. at this point. But it's still considered to be a bad movie, and I really don't agree. I actually find it legitimately entertaining beyond just like... Because I know what a so bad it's good feels like. The Room is not that. It's a totally different kind of experience. I disagree with that. The Room is bad. It's bad. It's not. The, you, so you're genuinely entertained during I'm, the like five-minute-long awkward sex scenes in that movie oh yeah oh yeah, oh, yeah definitely okay. and not even just in a, like why is he fucking her belly but like it's just if you treat it as like the bad r&b you groove to that i mean if you looked at that movie and said and and thought of it as every decision being conscious mm-hmm. to be the way it is it would be just like a really bizarre art film the fact that it wasn't intended to be that way i don't know that that destroys what it is because like a movie to me that's so bad it's good is usually just it's over the top ridiculous the entire time and right. just so much is done so ineptly but with the room some things are actually done pretty competently other things are ridiculously inept i mean just the tommy was so himself as an oddity of nature i think if you just observe him he creates art with his very being yeah so i don't know i i feel like there's something to enjoy there beyond just, oh my God, it's so awful. Because, I mean, there's movies like that, like Birdemic, Shock, and Terror. The feeling I get watching that is not the same as I get during the room, but I didn't want to squ- squabble over that all day. And plus, everyone knows about the fucking room. That's On not, top of that, it's not an interesting sure. recommendation this was more for somebody. Like, this was more like, at least in my mind, an underrated film. Sense. Right, exactly. Not necessarily a so bad it's good, just a film that you think that's why, panned that doesn't deserve it. Yeah, that's why I didn't really want to do The Room, because I think there's an argument about, right. is it just so bad it's good? This is a movie. This is about movies that we think have genuine merit Yes, that are despised. Um, and I think The Room might have fit into that for me, but I, I, I don't know. It just There's too much debate to be had there. So I didn't pick that. Uh, I don't know if you guys want to just reveal our picks slowly throughout, or if you want to just kind of do an overview or whatever. We could maybe do that at the end. I don't. I don't care. Uh, well, how did you did you just pull them in order? Or? Yeah, they're all in order, so we can reveal them one by one. I think that's probably the best yeah. way right. to do it. So we're gonna start with Scotty's because each of us picked three movies. 
with the criteria of this is a movie that's not well received by critics or audiences or whatever, but we think it's fucking good. We think it's a solid fucking movie. Right. And then we're going to take a look at the aggregate of what critics and audience think about these movies. And yes, that's correct. Um, so let's start with Scotty. Start with Scotty's three picks here. Uh, we're not going to alternate between the three of us. We're just going to go through everyone's list one sure. by one because that's how I have so it. So the first one, why don't you show the people? So the know. first film we're going to look at is a movie called Event Horizon. Infinite Space. A science fiction film from 1997. Infinite go ahead and read that. Coming in January, dude. Coming. I, I have to slob uh, coming. Scotty's knob on this one. I, I love this movie, <laughs> so I can't agree with him more here. I yeah. My first exposure to this movie was TJ actually went to see it in theaters. Mm. And I totally misunderstood what the movie is about. Like, he's like, it's Event Horizon. I'm like, that's something to do with it being underwater or something. He's like, no. And I'm like, that sounds lame. <laughs> so he went to see this. It was, it was totally up his alley. Um, and I thought I, you went with us. No, I didn't. I, I, I saw something oh. else. I thought it was like, that sounds like, for some reason, I was, as, like, I was young. So I, I somehow. I remember what, seeing it with Uncle Guy. Yeah, there was like some explanation to me that was like I somehow thought it was about it being underwater or something. So I saw some kids' movie. Instead. You could maybe even consider it in some ways a more faithful adaptation of Do- of Doom than the actual oh, dude, that, Doom movie. Unless you're gonna get to that, but uh, uh so my first ex- exposure to this really beyond you seeing it back when it came out in theaters, uh, this theatrical run was, uh, I saw an nostalgia critic review of it. and It's like this. So obviously he pans the movie largely, but it says there's obviously positive things about the film. So I went and checked it out, and I can see I can see that a lot of the criticism for the film, but at the same time, I think it's really one of the. It's just another example of studio meddling that just re- and all and, and and of course another big thing is test audiences, right? Because so so originally when this film was released, uh, the test audiences thought it was way too gory. So the guy that directed this. Had just come off. Uh, Paul W. S. Anderson had come off. Uh, not Street Fighter, excuse me. Mortal Kombat, which right. was a huge fucking hit. I mean, everyone knows Mortal Kombat. So I mean, Mortal Kombat's a hit, and he kind of. And, and obviously, the studio just wants him like make Mortal Kombat too, because I mean, the studio they want to do a cash, and he's like, no, I want to do this rated R haunted house, a fucking you know, basically the haunted house in space concept. You know, kind of like, and, and de- you definitely see the influence of Alien on the aesthetic in the film and the design of the ship and everything, especially the core. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's a pretty interesting film overall. Uh, do you guys want to talk about the plot of the film or do you just want to kind of talk about the, it's your pick. You got, I mean, whatever the reception, why just, you know, whatever re why is it here? You know, like, uh, I mean, why is it here? You talk about, cause you talk about so far you've talked about the film that could have been, why is the film as it exists now here on this? Oh, sure. Well, that's, well, that's kind of simple because I and feel if you like want, this, I also have the, uh, rotten I tomato feel like page this, so you can respond to critics directly if you want to. Um, we might do that, but what what I see with this film is that this is way, way fucking closer to a, what an actual Doom movie than the fucking one with, with the with Rock. I mean, that's a terrible fucking movie. You know, this fucking science experiment gone awry. That just shit. That shit in my mind. That, that just, it didn't fucking work. This one is like opening a fucking portal to another dimension, traveling outside of our space and time. And then bringing something terrible back. And the fucking horror of that ship is it, the atmosphere is actually pretty good. The gore is still they're like like the beginning. One of the beginning scenes of the movie is just a gore shot where it's like he, the guy basically is like he's like having a dream and his eyes are just fucking or, and like the woman's eyes are removed and his eyes are removed. And it's just like this kind of like satanic occult sort of thing that's going on. And it's just the, his Sam Neill's slow uh, uh, derangement throughout the film. I mean, in some Sam ways, Sam Neill and Lawrence Fishburne are great in this. Yeah, they're. I mean, they're great in this movie. It, it, like I said, it's very. It, it has a really strong tie, and it has a really strong vibe from like an Alien movie. So they're definitely kind of aping some of the stuff from that. There's also a pretty heavy, like kind of Lovecraftian thing. Oh yeah, draped over it. The fact that we opened a dimension, or up, you know, the ship opens a dimension, or a portal into a dimension. So basically, in the crazy the, thing, the plot of this movie is: imagine. is the ship you see here disappears like it's going to be some ex- ex- basically ex- uh, experiment to like bend space and time and to try to travel wherever they want to in the universe basically like create an event horizon a black hole so that ship just disappears and no one knows what happens and suddenly the ship appears uh, i think it's like uh, outside of neptune and they're gonna and, they, and this crew this this guy sam neil right is the doctor that basically designed the ship like the, and the, all the theories and stuff behind the ship he designed and Lawrence fishburne and his team are sent to go trying to figure out what has happened on the ship and slowly but surely, they, they just realize the ship is 
totally abandoned. It's just frozen in space. Everything on the ship is just like, it's basically the same temperature as the space around it. And they just slowly but surely just discover the horror that's transpired through like, there's like, there's like, they're trying to translate. Uh, one of the things in the movie is like, there's like video footage of the people kind of just losing their minds and they're trying to figure out what's going on. And it's just a really, there's all these pieces in the film. I don't feel they quite click together. So it does come across a little bit disjointed, but I think that it's really, like I said, a lot of the gore and the stuff that would have made it push it over the edge of being a really great film wasn't they, they weren't allowed to do that. I mean, the test audiences thought it was too gory, so they cut a lot of the cool, interesting. Uh, gore by the way, cult a scenes. lot of the uh, a lot of the critics that panned this movie that gave it. Uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you the statistics here: six point seven on IMDb, so pretty reasonably respected by the general public. Twenty seven percent on Rotten Tomatoes, mm-hmm. really dismal score. Uh, 35 on Metacritic, also a pretty dismal score. And I can tell you a lot of their criticisms of this movie um, are uh, still ro- rotate around. It's just so gory. It's, it's really so not. bloody. There's so much I mean, there's a little blood. bit of that. It's gross. There's a hint of that. Also, um, when you direct a film... It seems like a really dumb criticism of the fucking movie. It's supposed to be that way, And it right? was cut way too quickly because it was on such a tight schedule to try to make some fucking release... Um, I'm not sure when exactly it was released in, in the original one, but the, 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 basically the Directors Guild of America gives a, a director guaranteed 10 weeks, and Paul W. Anderson did not have that time to actually cut this film. Like I said, there was all, there's all any problems with the test audiences and people thinking it's too gory. So you basically just fucking kneecap this film. This whole concept is supposed to be a rated R fucking horror film, a science fiction horror film in space, and it's just already, it, I mean, it's basically censored. Uh... There's a lot of footage that they said is like famously of this film that's been lost that, you know, people are hoping it'll be recovered or whatever, but that's pretty much been dismissed. Like that's never going to happen. We're never going to get the actual director's cut version of this film. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just a film that I think was just so hobbled and what it could have been is probably a really interesting classic film. I, I I still think it's a good film, but to get that kind of iconic status that it kind of in a way deserves... And it kind of gets that now for being a really bad film. I, I just don't, I don't feel it's deserved. I, I feel like it's a film that's been panned for a lot of superficial reasons. Like, there's too much violence yeah, and there's too uh, much gore. I'll, I'll tell you what. When I went, to, I'll, I'll even show you here. Like, when I went to this page here uh, for the, the film, this critics page, I read through a lot of these reviews. And they're just really, like, the criticisms of the movie just seem really superficial. Like, they don't really justify their bad rating at all. Like, it, it just tends to be... The main criticisms I've seen are stuff you mentioned. Uh, a lot of them say it's disjointed, which I don't remember the film extremely well, but... It's not disjointed. I, 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 I remember the basic plot of the fucking thing. Yeah, you open a portal to some crazy dimension where everything is fucking nuts. That shouldn't make complete sense. It's supposed to be fraying the edges of sanity, uh, I remember the visuals being cool. I remember the shots of like fire in space and all that shit. Well, the visual being effects are good. Cool. Um, there uh, are parts of it that I don't think flow together very well. I think that also uh, another problem is some of the writing is kind of clunky for the film. Um, the, the, some of the names they give the characters, like the baby bear shit. But I mean, you see here a lot of this. I mean, shit- some of it's some of it's a little hokey, but I think overall it doesn't. It's th- it doesn't hugely detract from the film. A lot of these negative reviews you see here, though, the main thrust of their thing is really just whining about the gore that's in there. So I can't even imagine how they would have reacted to the intended vision if they couldn't even handle the amount of gore in this watered-down version that got released. But it doesn't deserve the rating it, it received at all. So, like, what would you say? I'd say a more appropriate rating. Like, uh, if you so were... So, it, right now... If I could control the rotten tomato, I would give it probably around the 80%. So you think it belongs in the 80s, and now it's in the 20s. So there's a huge disparity to where you think it should be versus where it is now. Uh, So what what do you think still works about the film? Because I feel like a lot of the stuff you talked about was kind of like, you know, Uh, this is the film that could have been. It was the the visuals of the film really lend itself to it. It gives you almost a 2001 Space Odyssey thing. Like you, obviously, they developed some pretty cool models for the film. Uh, Like I said, they had the, the, the the inner core that kind of makes the, the, the ship go from dimension to dimension. That is a really cool thing. It's so this giant orb, and you come into this room, and it's a very... Yeah, I remember that thing. There's some really great shots, and this, just like when you're like just kind of in awe of the design of the ship, and 
I mean, the whole concept in itself, I really enjoy. I really enjoy that this like, kind of portal to another dimension just being opened and just the chaos it brings with it. And it's like the dangers of this, like almost like the pitfall and kind of the message of the movie. It's like when you open Pandora's box, you don't know what's going to, you know, when you do something like this, when this boundary is pushed, what is going to happen? And I kind of, I, I guess it's kind of like, you know, that old thing with technology and the warning of what we can, you know, humanity can eventually accomplish. You know, and obviously the doctor being corrupted by his vision of just, no, at progress at any cost. You know what I mean? Right. So, I mean, I, I, I felt, you know, a lot of the elements of the story worked. I liked it. Like I said, I think this is a more faithful Doom movie than the one that actually has it, the name slapped on it. And I've always been kind of interested in that concept. So that's honestly, to me, what really worked in the film. And I, and I think it's genuinely a scary, unsettling film. Yeah, I can't really bring myself to disagree much. I remember watching it in the theaters with uh, Uncle Guy when we were when I was a kid. I guess ninety seven. I'd have been twelve, probably about the perfect age to see this kind of movie. Um, and I remember really enjoying it then. And I probably saw it again when I was like fifteen or sixteen, and really enjoying it then. Haven't seen it, so it's basically half a lifetime ago that I've last seen this movie. Well, you should definitely check it out. I've but seen I- this movie a bunch of times. I saw it for the first time at sixteen in the theaters, yeah. and it blew me away. There, I loved it. It was uh, like a sorely needed gap in good horror movies and gory horror movies and sci-fi tinged horror movies at that time, and. I don't know. I just really like the movie. So we're all pretty much in agreement that this is this film is underrated. It's dog. Yeah, vastly. It's 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 uh, the ratings for this are dog shit. Don't listen to them. Don't listen to the critics. And because Scotty apparently uh, has a boner and this is a movie I literally caught him jerking off to, by the way. But uh, (laughs) that's why I picked it, dude. Since Scotty has a boner for science fiction movies made in 1997. I do. uh, Oh, Starship Troopers. A new kind of enemy, a new kind of war. This is like a new kind of masturbatory experience. You know what, dude? It's It's a verse of film. It truly is. No, it really is. This is one of those movies that came when it came out was just grossly misunderstood. Yeah, I'll go ahead and give you the rundown real quick if you want. Uh, 7.2 on IMDb. So pretty respected there. Uh, 63% on Rotten Tomatoes, which is not a great rating. It's not a dismal one. And 51 on uh, Metacritic, which is uh, on the, you know, that's that's considered bad. Um, I guess a 63 is not a great score either. Um, I will tell you the criticisms of this movie tend to be from the perspective of people who I don't think really got it. Like, I know these critics fancy themselves very intelligent, I don't think they understood that it was criticizing this. fascism and oh, totally. jingoism and militarism. Well, look, you know, I think that they thought Paul, it was Paul actually Verhoeven, embracing those things. Who directed the film, I mean, called Robocop basically the American Jesus. I mean, this is someone that uses this, he kind of uses this over jingoistic macho sort of shit, but he, he, he makes it more subversive to show kind of like how flaw, ultimately how flawed and self-serving it is. But like, Starship Troopers, I, I, I can see the criticism of it, but it, that's people that take it at face value, and I think a lot of people really miss that. I mean, I'm not saying as a kid that I totally got it. I kind of just like they were killing giant bugs. There's also people who take it at face value and like it. So, yeah, of course. There's always like, Yeah, people. that's great. Fascism. Cool. Yeah, the, the only people that can vote are people in the military. That's a good idea. Well, and the whole idea, too. So they, basically the premise is, like, you have this guy named Rico, and it's like, oh, shit, my girlfriend's going to go off and join the fucking military, which is that's kind of the big thing for people to do in this universe. That's the only way you can vote and become an actual citizen of the world that you live in is that you have to basically you have to have mandatory military service. So these bugs, quote unquote, attack Earth and uh, Rio de Janeiro, which which they all live in and do massive damage. Um, but as the movie progresses and the more you learn about it, it seems very suspect that this primitive bug culture launched any sort of attack on any fucking planet through interstellar means. Uh, and it's really just a social commentary on fascism and how militaristic you know people and and how people really kind of go and praise that and how in this especially in this society where it's hyper militarized how that's only that thing is the only viable path in which you your opinion actually matters if you've actually gone off and killed these bugs or whatever it is 
Now, it's based on some novel. This novel has nothing to do with that. It's not even worth mentioning. <laughs> yeah, uh, the, the novel was pretty... The source material was pretty much ignored in the same way that The Shining yeah. source material and was it, ignored by Stanley Kubrick. And it, it, it's, it's very reminiscent of just going to another country, as you'll see, and just fighting just basically people with some fucking AK-47s. I think I, you could kind of think of it as a really violent episode of Black Mirror where the message is not as much shoved down your fucking throat. Like, it's just, like, more subtle... But it's, and like, it's weird to call this movie subtle because it really doesn't seem to be. But I well, guess but it it's is. Like, when when they go to these planets to fight get... the bugs, it's it's just exactly what a military blunder would be. So the first time they're like, okay, we're just gonna, they're dumb bugs. All we have to do is go down there and kill them. For some reason, they, they think that's a good idea. So they're routed, basically. All these humans get killed from all these planets. It's like, oh, shit, we made a mistake. Now we're just going to bombard them from space. So it kind of makes them seem like they're viable enemies, but they're really not. The bugs are pretty much just, I mean, they're hostile, but they're kind of hapless at the same time. You know what I mean? So what exactly were you jerking off to in this film, Scotty? <coughs> the lava Be bugs. Be honest. The, la the lava bugs. I've admitted it several times. That's the truth. That's not, you're not kayfabing it. Oh, you I'm, wanted the lava bugs? I wanted them deeply and passionately. Wow. I'm, I'm sorry, dude. If lava bugs don't do it for you. I mean, so I'm going to go ahead and read a few of these little excerpts here from these uh, reviews. Uh, lacking the sophistication of the average comic book, it compensates with panoramic attack sequences reminiscent of the Japanese swarm attacks in American war movies. Look at that dude's picture. Yep. It's just an old vampire looking dude. <laughs> yeah, whatever. I am Lacey. Every day. <laughs> This movie made me want to puke. How dare anybody make a film? Ew. <laughs> eh, 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 eh. Uh, Liam of course, from Canada. Uh, lacks the courage of the book's fascist conclusions. Did you like, say it's not fascist enough? I don't. I don't really agree with that conclusion. Uh, maybe the filmmakers are so I mean, lost in look. their slam bang visual effects they don't give a hoot. About the movie's that, scariest no, that per, implications. That, guy that person a, doesn't get it. That, well, that guy's a moron. That, not this guy, but the guy before is a moron. Well, this guy, that, too. Because remember, they have the thing at the end where it's like, it, 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 especially showing, like, we can beat these bugs, we can fight them, and it's like they're basically making an ad at the end of the movie where it's like, Rico's Roughnecks. Oh, that's your buddy. I'm taking it, like, I, I'm taking yeah. over the unit, and they, they show all the new generation, but it's like, they, all these people are just as indoctrinated into this bullshit. So nothing, but the, the conclusion you draw from this is, yeah, all these people have lost. You know, and obviously there's a, there's a cost they paid for this, but at the same time they haven't learned anything. Let's see what Paul's they're just recruiting the next generation of idiots what, uh, to go off and fight in a fuck to fight in some other fucking war zone. Yeah, let's see what Paul's buddy thinks. Roger Ebert, two stars. Starship Troopers is the most violent kitty movie ever made. Full I call stop. It, that I, I stop reading right there. I call it a kitty movie, not to be insulting, but to be accurate. Its action, characters, and values are pitched at 11-year-old science hey, fiction I was fans. 10 when I saw this, so... That makes it true to its source. It's based on a novel for juveniles by Robert A. Heinlein. I read it at, to the point of memorization when I was in grade school. I have improved since then. But the story has not... Oh, my God. Boom! This fart sniffing Atomic stuff. bomb of criticism. Wow, I hate this man with the a, premise. a fiery red-hot passion. Blah, 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 blah. Let's see. It doesn't matter since the bugs aren't important except for his props. Da, 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 da. Um, where's the criticism at? I don't need a fucking whole recap. What's lacking is exhilaration and sheer entertainment. What? Unlike the Star Wars movies, which embraced a joyous vision and great comic invention, Starship Troopers doesn't resonate. Oh, you mean the Star Wars movie that you panned when it first came out, and then later, when everybody else considered a classic, went back and revised your views on? It's one-dimensional. We smile at the satirical asides, but where's the warmth of human nature? The spark of genius or rebellion? If Star Wars is humanist, Starship Troopers is totalitarian. That's the point. That's the point. All right. Whatever. He's dead. He's long dead. Thank goodness. He's long fucking dead. He is. I mean, this is not like an overly cerebral or intellectual film. I think it can be. It really is a I, film but, that. But, but I think it's a film that's going to give back what you put into it. In my opinion. Well, I, I said overly. I'm not saying that it doesn't make you think at all. I'm just saying that I honestly believe it's just a really enjoyable fucking movie. Like maybe you can say it's a guilty pleasure, but I, I mean honestly, I when this came out, I had never seen anything like it. 
And I haven't really seen much like it since. I mean, it really stood out to me as like an interesting film. I mean, yeah, there's obviously multifaceted points. There's just mindless action, if that's what you're looking for. Like you said, the satirical sides, sure, but I kind of liked how the film was presented. Like, do you want to know more? You know, I, I kind of like uh, a lot of elements of the film. I don't think it's like the best film of all time, but I definitely think it's not a fucking piece of shit. And I think at the end of the day, it's like it's it just if it, it, it just was it fell into the trap a lot of criticism of, of, of these early CGI films at the time it was like oh it's just some big fucking action piece and it's a bunch of CGI crap and no one cares but I mean Hollywood's more than embraced CGI they've shoved it down our throats and I don't think it's overwhelming in this film I think a lot of the scenes and like action scenes are actually really competently done and I think a lot of the fucking messages still ring true to this day and we can say oh he's evolved beyond that but sure I mean everyone's gonna change in their lives I don't think it's really even a juvenile novel if we're being perfectly honest, but I, I, I defend the film and think it's really, it's a really decent action film from the nineties and science fiction film. The next film, if no one has anything else to add to the Starship Troopers discussion. Nope. Is Perfume, the story of a murderer from the director of Run, Lola, Run, based on the best-selling novel, so which if, if you guys I seen read. This, uh, I have not seen Perfume. I have seen the film, and I have read the novel as Same. well by Patrick Suskind, I think his name was. Um, so IMDb for this movie, really pretty high, 7.5, well-respected movie. Low tomatoometer, uh, 58%. Which I was shocked to, to see that. 58% on uh, Rotten Tomatoes, which is lower than Starship Troopers. Uh, 56 on Metacritic, which is higher than Starship Troopers, so just shows you the disparity between the different critic aggregates there. Um, not a not a despised movie, but I believe 58% is considered rotten. It is considered rotten. Uh, and 56% is considered whatever the Metacritic version of rotten is. So, uh, yeah, uh, not really a well-liked movie, but not really a despised movie. I like that this movie is a period piece. Um, it's based on a really interesting novel, and it's something that very few people think about, which is smell and scent and how it informs our lives. And I, I think that uh, the main character, John Baptiste Grenouille, is just a really interesting character. And I think that uh, the portrayal of him in the film is pretty good. I think it's pretty much spot on. When I smell the retard, I uh, I go crazy. <laughs> I be I begin to lick and, and, the and leg. And I, and I like the patterns in this film. Like everyone who's I mean, from his mother on to everyone whose life he touches, um, the minute he leaves their life is just tragic. Like when he's born, his mother just abandons him at birth. Right. And then and then of course they hear the baby and they go, What's that? You abandon your baby and she runs off. She meets the gallows. He's sold to an orphanage. Or you know, or, or basically, the, the orphanage takes him in because they get money from the government to obviously care for these kids. And immediately, they all the kids are kind of like, even as a baby, they're like, "There's something wrong with this baby." Like they don't trust this baby. It's like, and it's just kind of weird. Like he's just is always just separated from because the even though the the whole thing is he's a sociopath. One, he has no scent of his own, which is why there's an inherent distrust. But that's a huge realization point right. in the film. Like he, he has no scent. It's the minute he gets freedom in the film. It's like he finally, like he's worked for all these people his whole life. He's just been basically been a serf or an indentured servant or a slave almost. Yeah. And he finally goes up to the mountains and he's in a cave. There's nothing around. And it's like the only thing, the only thing he's him is like, he's, and he's smelling everything. And he finally comes to the realization at that point. It's like, I don't have a scent. Right. And that's, that's the reason people don't trust him. Cause on some level, you know, that him not having a scent makes people reject him and makes it and them fear him. him and, almost makes him a non-entity in their minds. Like, because he has no scent, he's forgettable to people, but at the same time, repellent. Like, they don't remember his face. They don't remember his name. They don't remember things about him. He's almost like a shadow. And uh, he also, on top of having no scent of his own, he has a very powerful sense of smell. Yeah. Um, and uh, the reason he becomes a murderer is because he starts murdering women who have this uh, very divine, powerful scent. And that, like in uh, the movie, it, it's illustrated by like he's delivering some furs and he just catches the scent of this woman, and it's just irresistible. And like he lo like you can tell like everything else he's doing just becomes secondary. He just wanders off. He's wandering the streets of Paris until he finds her, and it's just like. And it's just like a revelation for him. And then he's like, he dedicates his life to capturing this scent, this kind of sublime pinnacle of like humanity, like it's, which basically, of course, is in the novel, beautiful redheaded women that are yeah. young. 
And he becomes a, a perfumer himself, and he actually figures out that there are certain scents that he can give himself that will make him be treated in different ways. Like he can make himself respected or feared or whatever he wants based on the sense that he's giving himself. And I, I love the end of this film. I love, and I know yes. Paul, you're one that hates endings, but this, this film has a great ending. I mean, the novel as well has a great ending. I will always remember it. And I'm not going to spoil it here. Cause I think if you haven't seen it, you should definitely check out, check out this film. Uh, what are the criticisms of this film that you that you found? Uh, you so found? if you go to the page here, you see uh, it's so rotten. Pretty well liked by audiences overall, uh, but not as well That's received by critics. Uh, let's see. Um, hated this movie. Hated it. Richard that, Roper. Okay. That, what, 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 where's the criticism? hated it? I hated it. I just hated it. I just didn't like it. <laughs> Perfume: The story of a murderer is another nauseous example of style over content. A toxic tale of serial homicides set in 18th century France that creeps you out faster than it makes you think. A Rex Reed is another bloated piece of shit yeah. that you should never listen to when it comes to movies. These are all bloated pieces of shit. I despise this movie more or less for the promises it squanders. Uh, I don't know. Whatever. Like it's it's always such vague bullshit when they dismiss these films. Let's see what Richard Roper's detailed review has to say. I clicked the wrong thing there. I, I don't think it's available. Is it not? No. Wow, that's bullshit. Yeah, some of them aren't. Hated this movie. Hated it. Hated it. Didn't yeah, like it. Can't see Rex Reed. No, you can I mean, see the look. ones that say full review underneath them. You can see those. Yeah, that's weird. None of these show you well, shit. Here's here's this guy, uh, Cinemaphile. This is full. All right, review. let's see what his full review says. Oh God, it's so long. Wow. Blah, 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 blah. Um, I don't want to... Uh, so, well, yeah, I think he was talking about the ending there. I didn't want to give so it away. Bad, bad endings. So he actually thought the ending was bad. Uh, blah, blah, blah. I think a lot of these people find these end- uh, the, these over-the-top sort of scenes to be gratuitous. Oh, look, he gave Alien Covenant three stars. So, <laughs> There lies the launch point of Perfume, the story of a murderer, a film that takes on the strange mission of creating a character whose loathsome misdeeds are a consequence of something more than just your run-of-the-mill murderous tendencies. Some would read between the lines and discover only warped reasoning to frame his psyche, but there's a lot... Uh, that makes sense here, even if it's just for the sake of following the story's volatile, dramatic currents. Blah, blah, blah. It doesn't sound like a criticism so far. It doesn't sound like something you'd say I mean, about a one-star it, movie. Yet again, it's... It, I mean, I'm not saying that just originality itself is just good, but I mean, I haven't really seen many films or hardly any that were sent to play such a crucial role to the film, and especially in this context... Uh, he says I, I, the plot is misguided, uh, lacks artistic distinction, uh, bad editing. Mm, um, I don't really, yeah, I don't know. It's just that. a bunch of bullshit. I mean, ultimately, this is all subjective, but I, I just don't feel those are huge flaws in the movie. I feel, I mean, even though it has about uh, it's a 147 minute runtime, it doesn't feel that. I don't feel like this is an overly long film. You have great performances. Um, Poster is cool as fuck, too. You uh, by I mean Alan Rickman is in this film and he has a, I mean he has a smaller role but he's uh, I think he's pretty competent in the film he he's kind of like the guy in the town that's kind of advocating for different measures of how to prevent this because he has a, a be- especially a beautiful daughter so, so it's kind of like so he's he, got a vested interest in like yeah, you and, know and he's kind of also like like you said there's almost like a primordial thing that he realizes that she is definitely a target for this person and whatever's going on in this town. Uh, where he's basically doing these killings. And I mean, uh, maybe uh, not. Maybe she smells like shit. You know, you never know. <laughs> uh, the lead guy, uh, I think his name is Ben Wishaw. Yeah. Um, Let me see. I could probably see the cast. He, uh, he, he, he turns a very good performance. In the film. I, I mean, like, like I said, this isn't a very expository film. There's a lot of very long, dramatic scenes. Like when he's, right. I remember there actually being what, very little dialogue yeah, like, in this movie. That's what I'm saying. So it, it tells a lot it of the story visually, which I think is a definitely a plus. I mean, the, the scene like at the end with the crowd. I mean, that's just a great scene visually. I mean, the visuals work to me. I don't find the editing to be R for aberrant behavior clunky. involving nudity, violence, sexuality, I, I and disturbing say, images. I think, aberrant. Aberrant. I think when you, I think with a lot of these fucking th- the things it comes down to is these people are all fuddy duddies and they're stodgy and the, anything that's different or subversive or doesn't have the same ideals. I do also remember liking that Dust, they, that Dustin want, Hoffman in this movie as well. Oh, he was great in this movie. Dustin Hoffman has uh, he's almost always great in the movie. Yeah, and uh, he's a, he has a pretty juicy role in it. Not a huge role, but he's he a has great a comic been role too. Though he, what's that? Hasn't he been me too? Yeah, he has. Yeah, okay, never mind. He's a piece of shit. Yeah, oh yeah, I'm sorry. His performance is terrible. Film. Terrible film. Stain terrible movie. Film. Terrible for even considering putting Dustin Hoffman in anything because he's evil. Um, 
So anyway, that's Scotty's picks. Um, so Scotty, you, would you be curious to know the averages? Yes, I would. Because I went ahead and I totaled the averages of your films. So I know you could do math, DJ. I'm surprised. Uh, well, I had an app or something did it for oh, okay. me. Uh, but IMDb, your your average IMDb score, uh, seven point one. Pretty high. So actually. you kind of cheated there. I think your film picks are kind of bullshit because it's not even a bad fucking IMDb score. These are all films that general audiences like. Just films that critics didn't care for enough. 49% on Rotten Tomatoes, which is rotten. That's rotten. 47% on Metacritic, which is whatever their stupid... I don't, know, I don't know what their fucking shit whatever, is. They yeah. don't have a rotten or whatever. It's, it's red or yellow Shitty. or whatever. It's poopy. It's, their, it's on the shit scale. I don't know. I don't, I don't use their site. Um, well, these are underrated films because, I mean, for the most part, <laughs> maybe with the exception of Starship Troopers, I don't hear many people... like. Maybe Why don't you defend a film that's genuinely fucking hated, Scotty, like I had the balls to do on my I list? Most of these films had a lot of detractors and critics, TJ. I mean, you can view it differently, but I think you're wrong. No, I think you're a fucking stupid piece of shit, Scotty. That's what I think. You're entitled to your incorrect opinion. You cocksucker. You're a bad person, Scotty. You're a I bad be- fucking person. I believe in the room. You're the bisexual. Oh, Paul, actually, you're as well. Yep. So you guys are definitely the cocksuckers over me. Uh, I guess so, yeah. No, those, uh, I never said anything. Uh, you know, I'm not I'm not taking a side. Because TJ, I think, is the one that cheated on his list. What'd I do? What'd I cheat? How'd I cheat? Well, what we'll happened? see when you get there. Uh, All right. So, um, <laughs> whoa, whoa. Who picked this? TJ. This is my pick. This is a my TJ first pick, p- for sure. My first fucking pick. Friday the 13th, part VII, that's seven, the new blood. On Friday the 13th, Jason is back, but this time, someone's waiting. Oh. Dun, 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 dun. So, IMDb, 5.3. That's pretty low. Rotten Tomatoes. 29 percent damn metacritic 13 so this is in the fucking toilet dude so yeah not even not liked by critics at all not that any of the friday the 13th movies were uh and not even really you know didn't really resonate with audiences very much either but man fuck all those stupid sons of bitches because this movie has got some merit and i'll tell you why why tj because it the premise of the movie is essentially Jason versus Carrie, but they didn't have the rights to Carrie, so they just gave some other bitch psychic powers. And you know what? It delivers on that fucking premise. There is a huge 20-minute fucking battle at the end of this movie between Jason and this telekinetic bitch that is well worth the price of admission. Jason never goes down harder than he does in this fucking movie. They fucking... They blow him up. They drop a house on him. They fucking do all kinds of crazy shit. They strangle him. They, she throws shit at him psychically. His mask breaks off after she causes it to squeeze his head until his fucking pus is coming out of the back and shit. I mean, it's brutal. And he fucking... I think the, the, the ma- unmasked Jason in this movie is the best unmasked Jason they ever did in any of the fucking films. Now, the way he does ultimately die, I will grant you, is lame. She somehow uses her powers in a way that we never, it was never established she could to bring her dead father back to life, to wrap a chain around Jason and drag him to the bottom of Camp Crystal Lake. So that makes zero sense. But you know what? It's a fucking Friday the 13th movie. I'm not expecting high art out of this motherfucker, but you know what? It took a fucking stale ass premise of. Jason kills a bunch of teenagers. Jason kills a bunch of teenagers. Jason kills... Now, he does do that once again, but you know what? They fucking gave it a little twist, and I think it works. I mean, don't you think there's a better way of doing that than this inventing a, a bitch I'm not fever, favorite dream of a stoner, dude. <laughs> I'm not saying like. that there's not a better way. Of course, there's probably better ways, but you know what? They, they decided what they were going to do. They picked their gimmick. They did it, and I think they but used they it do, to optimal effect. But did effect. they do it well... They did I mean, it pretty fucking well, dude. I, I mean, mean, look, I think they did. Last 20 did. minutes of that movie, you're badass. I and think, the rest of it is just your standard Jason movie. If you liked any other Jason movie, you should like this one just fine. There's nothing bad about it. I the really kills are though. good. I really don't think it's that great of a Jason film. <laughs> I mean, I haven't seen this movie in it's, a long I, I time. I think it's okay, though. But I, I remember w- feeling like pretty ripped off by it. 
I felt like it spent way too much time focused on the dumb chick with psychic powers and way too little time focusing on Jason. And quite frankly, I didn't like seeing Jason beat so fucking hard. He's the hero of these movies, and I feel like this movie was trying to take this new psychic bitch and make her the hero. Hey, you know, she he, Jason had to triumph over some fucking... But Jason always loses. Just like Tom from Tom and Jerry. Just like, uh, you know, any other fucking villain who's constantly foiled. Especially in these 80s well, horror movies. Whether well, yeah, it be Michael uh, Myers or Freddy Krueger or whatever. I'll tell you what, Jason... Didn't, didn't Jason win in uh, Freddy vs. Jason? Or they team Jason up at the Jason did end? pretty much win. Although, Freddy did that little stupid wink at the end. Like, I didn't really lose because we can't definitively take a side on this. But you know what? It did take a side in Carrie versus Jason, which is what I've always called this movie. And it said <laughs> yeah. Carrie would kick Jason's fucking ass. And that's just that. Do you think that that's actually true, though? Um, like if you took the Carrie from the you know original story and yeah, I mean, dropped her she... in the room with the best representation of Jason. Yes. You think Carrie wins that? I think Carrie fucks him up, dude. Hmm. I mean, look, he's got, he's got some skills, you know, and he gives her a run for her money. That is depicted, but you know what? It takes a lot of her. She's got to do a lot against him. She's got to throw about a billion things at him. She's got to turn his mask against him. She's got to drop a fucking house on him. Well, first she drops him through the floor. Then she drops the house on him, and his ass still comes back for more. And it isn't until she somehow develops necromancy, which I guess Carrie never had that skill. Yeah, I mean, so how's, uh, that's kind yeah, of like see, that's bullshit. I mean, I guess Carrie did maybe kind of have that skill because her hand does come out of the grave at the end, but it's just a dream. But is it really? Who knows? Um, so I don't know. Yeah, I think Carrie would fuck. I think Carrie would fuck Jason up. She can. She's got. She doesn't have to be near you to do something to you. You know, she can fucking send anything yeah, around you, know you at you at any given time. Until you break out the fucking necromancy angle, she what? Was she really gonna win? I don't know. Probably See? not. They shouldn't have done that. Well, see, the movie should have ended with her, quote unquote, beating him. And then the last few frames of the movie should be her getting eviscerated by him. Fought, we, I mean, we, we, we if you're going to make that criticism, win. then you can say that about every Jason movie. You should just, Jason should just perpetually win every well, time. Well, he does, though. Not really. He yes, always he does. He pretty much always gets defeated he, and wrapped up by the end of the movie. Because he always comes back. Yeah, but he it's comes back from this, too. He setback. comes back in a, a, a way worse movie, uh, Jason Takes Manhattan. Oh, God, it's awful. Where... <laughs> for a movie, look, that's another thing. This actually delivered on its promise. Jason Takes Manhattan did not deliver on the promise of Jason in Manhattan. Most of it takes place on a fucking boat. Yeah, that does suck. So that was a total ripoff. This one I don't think is a ripoff. I think if you want to see... Look, if you're like me and you want to see Jason battle a telekinetic bitch, it is in this movie, it happens, and it's good. Well, fair enough. And uh, the rest of the movie leading up to it, pretty mediocre, but I don't know. It's got a cool climax. And I've shown it to other people, and most of them have agreed with me, man. That's all I'm saying. Oh, whatever. Unlike man. these assholes here. Uh, next movie, I want to... Well, I guess I, could take, I guess we could take a look at some of the, uh, the yeah, reviews here. yourself. Dude. See, the audience don't like it either. Of course they don't. I love it, man. I think it's great. It's probably my favorite Jason movie. The filmmakers have mastered the blood but not the tedium of all the predictable killings, nor have they eliminated the hate women subtext of the... Oh, boo-hoo, Gene Siskel. Me too, fucking before me too, me too, you piece of shit. Ooh, sexist, boo. Jason gets his ass kicked by a woman in this. Yeah, that, How's that, it sexist? That angle doesn't really make much you sense. You cocksucker. Uh, look at all these good reviews, though. Felix Vasquez Jr. feels me. Um... Uh, by this seventh entry in the series, being different just for the sake of it really is justification enough. Well, that sounds positive to me. Whatever. Uh, does this even appeal to hardcore Jason fans? I doubt it. Well, your doubt is misplaced, cunt. I mean, I don't know, dude. I'm a pretty hardcore Jason fan, and that movie <laughs> not don't appeal like me. to me. Not like me. Apparently not. I'm not willing to suck the dick of Jer Carrie versus Jason, dude. <laughs> a gimmick movie. Man, nasty, no man. one understands this fucking film, A movie dude. where the in image of fucking Jason was further abused. Yeah, look at that shit. That's pretty think, fucking cool, dude. I think that they have did it worse, but for you to say that that is what we should look at and That's say that the Jason definitive looks best, like. dude. I mean, it may that may be true, but it's still awful. Nah, dude. It's, it's badass. Awful. That's pretty awful. It's badass, dude. 
And the animatronics on it and shit are good. And that is the legendary fucking Kane Hodder playing Jason in this movie because he's a badass motherfucker, dude. He's the one true definitive Jason in my mind. Well, audiences and critics disagree with you. Well, you know what? I, you know what I say to people? Go out there and check this movie out. Tell me if I'm wrong, bitch. Tell me if I'm fucking wrong. Whenever they say you're wrong, you're just going to say you're right. Yeah, they're stupid if they're yeah, there you go. So they're don't, bother totally with, don't bother with telling. All right, anything. next movie I uh, decided I wanted to defend. Uh, a movie that every time I've ever tried to show it to anyone, they've always either left the room or said, this sucks, let's change it off. But I think it's fucking awesome. I don't know. I don't understand that. Because, yeah, this movie is fucking great. Death to Smoochie, uh, IMDb 6.4, Rotten Tomatoes 42, Metacritic 38. Dude, you know the problem with this one? Uh, I, the last one I don't agree with you on, but I totally agree with you on this one. This was before its time, dude. It really is. Like, because I, I think if you made this today, this would be a hit. You think so? Oh, totally, dude. It's just like, it, well, this, it's way more meta. But at the time, there really wasn't a thing. But now it's like super popular to be meta. Yeah, you it is. I mean? It is super meta, and it's also just real dark. It's a super bleak comedy. It does have kind of a weirdly forced positive resolution, but yeah, whatever. Aside that. from that shit, it's a really cynical fucking movie. It's really dark. It's all about people who are, uh, you know, charities and children's shows and all this stuff are all just really dark. And exploitative and all this horrible shit's going on. I gotta tell you what a fucking joy it was to see Robin Williams get to play a genuine villain. Yes. You know what I mean? Not one of these uh, relatable everyman roles, which is really, uh, most of his career, that's how he was cast. (coughs) Yeah. You know, Um, and to see Robin Williams really let off the chain in a movie to be a total fucking, like, just insane... And you know, I don't even like I don't even like Edward Norton sociopath. and I like him in this. And Edward Norton is brilliant in this. I don't know what your fucking hard on against Edward Norton is. Edward Norton is an asshole. Like every, I don't care ev- about that. I like that about him. Yeah. But like you can't deny like I just don't know, dude. He's been brilliant in so many movies. Yeah, he's been shit in so many movies. Like what? Like Hulk or even his That movie was shit though. Yeah, it, the movie was shit, but he wasn't good in it either. Well, I, I, I'll give you that, but I mean, I'm I'll not saying what, everything he's his, ever done is great. breakout fucking role, Primal Fear, go watch that movie. I that movie's good. Everyone Fuck was coming you. over it. Everyone, Yeah, look, I thought so too, but I went and revisited it. It does not hold up. It's a piece I watched, of shit. I watched, I watched it shit. this year. It's a piece of well, shit. Well, not this year. I watched it in 2018. It is no, not a piece of shit. shit. That it's movie is not a piece of shit. You know what? We're destined, he's terrible at it. We're talking about death His His accent is nothing at all. Whatever. Yeah, you're right. No, no, no. Fuck this Edward Norton digression bullshit. Yeah, well, I just don't like you shitting all over a fucking good actor Edward Norton for no sucks reason. dick. He sucks dick. Well, Fight Club. Danny DeVito's great he in this movie, fight too. Club. <laughs> he was good in Fight Club. Oh, Danny DeVito. Didn't Danny do direct, direct this? Uh, I believe he did. Let me check. <coughs> all I know is that he was fantastic in it. <laughs> uh, yeah, yes. I don't know why people don't love this movie. I really don't get it. Dude, this... Of all the movies on this list, the one with the hate that I understand the least... Is death a smooch? Like, I can understand if some... Like, Event Horizon's too bloody for me. Whatever, you're a pussy. That's fine. Starship Troopers, you don't get it. It's too fucking smart for you. Perfume, maybe it's boring or it's too slow. Yeah. Uh, Friday the 13th is schlock, which I admit it is. I think it's good schlock, but it's schlock. Death to Smoochie is a legitimately smart, funny, interesting goddamn movie with compelling characters and shit. And 42%... Fuck you. Yeah. I mean, this is a movie that has a lot to say. A lot of that criticism is aimed directly at the entertainment industry. This kind of mass produced uh, shit that we're given and how the people behind it don't really matter. It's all a bunch of marketing decisions. And uh, so here we go. Let me just read some reviews if you want. Uh, let's see. Is there an Ebert review? A broad braying yuck fest that revels in coarse jokes. Coarse jokes. Lacks the courage of its own cynicism and refuses to develop its own premise. What other movie has the premise that this movie has? None. So what does that mean? What do you mean? He, it's just, a, it's just, this is another one of those like fart sniffing critic things where I've decided Listen, I dislike no, no, this read movie. Read Richard Roper's. Read Richard Roper's, dude. All right. I'm sure that some country, maybe France or something, will hail this as a work of genius because it's so incredibly awful. Wrong again, dude. What a fucking what, why douche. Are you, what, what are you throwing France under the bus for, you fucker? You know why? Because Richard Roper, like his buddy Roger Ebert, 
may Satan keep his soul in eternal torture, <laughs> is not a critic. He's an industry shill. You know why Richard Roper didn't like this movie? Because his bosses at Viacom and Sony and MGM didn't like this movie because it was a movie that portrayed them as a bunch of murdering narcissists that hated the people that they made movies for. Here's a, here's a, here's a, this is apparently a bad review. It says a blacker than black comedy. That's a positive review in my book. Yeah, like when did that become a bad thing? An awful, embarrassing movie? No, an awful, embarrassing take on a great, subversive film. Considering that it's meant to be a comedy about a TV children's show, DeVito's picture is particularly irritating, nasty, and mean-spirited. What? What the fuck? That's the fucking point. The, the point? That juxtaposition is at the heart of the humor of the fucking film, you Emmanuel how, Levy. How would it be an interesting film if the behind the scenes was like, everyone gets along and everyone's great and we're having a great old time here making fucking smoochy. Woohoo! It's wonderful! That, that wouldn't be an interesting film. Where's the conflict? Where are the, where are the fucking interesting characters? Like, everyone in this movie... I mean, look... Robin Williams is great in this fucking film. Edward Norton, I, I would say, is still, <laughs> also is great in this film. I mean, I think for this I don't one, remember Danny DeVito's role too much in this, but like, to he's understand funny. why the industry shills hate, hated this, a brief overview of the plot. It's about a kid's show run by a guy played by Robin Williams. Yeah, who Rainbow gets caught up, Randall or something like that. He gets caught up in a scandal taking money for appearances on the show and is run out of town and is replaced by... This kind of newcomer to the kids show scene, Edward Norton, who plays Smoochie the Rhino, and he's a total fucking amateur, but he's basically manipulated by the big corporations into becoming the next Rainbow Randolph right. type character, and, and he, he hates it. And unlike uh, Rainbow Randolph or Randall or whatever his name was, I think it was, was it Randolph or Randall? Do you remember? Just Randolph. Randolph. Okay, so unlike Rainbow Randolph, who is William uh, Williams' character, who is totally jaded and cynical, Edward Norton actually plays this role very, like, Optimistic, naive. Yeah. Like a babe in the woods. Yeah, like, like yeah, I'm, I'm going to make a kid show. And he, show. of course, is great. totally exploited by everyone around him. <coughs> he's like a vegan, upon, and, he's, and he's all about hyper-positivity and yoga and self-affirmation, and the industry just chews him up. I mean, they treat him like a fucking less than a used condom as soon as he shows up. And they just continuously, slowly but surely, yeah. tamp down everything that makes him special and turn him into this corporatized piece of shit. And he goes nuts, just like Rainbow Randolph did. And, uh, you know, it, it really is a movie, if anything, if it's criticizing anything, it's criticizing the entertainment industry and the way it prepackages these... Uh, you, you know, media figures and feeds them to us. How, then, how it makes them seem like they're genuine people, but in all reality, they're but just how a, genuinely replaceable yeah, they are. Well, they're a PR stunt. Well, I've, I've said this about YouTube itself. Just in the, you know, the influencers of the day, these social media people, like you don't think they can replace you in two seconds? Like they can just go because these they platforms do. can 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 basically channel anyone they want. They can they can push anyone up they want. Yeah, I mean, who the fuck is Ray William Johnson? Anybody remember that guy? <laughs> yeah, they fucking. They, they, do these people that are pushed out in front to sell a product are interchangeable. That's what this movie is about. And people and will that just, on. people don't care. The people ultimately don't care what they're given as long as it's crafted and, and, to do the right thing. And that's what and that's the whole point I was making too. Like this movie is actually more applicable and makes more sense today now than ever before. Totally agree. Totally ahead of its time. And this one has like this is the first one that I honestly feel like has been egregiously shit on, uh, especially by Rotten Tomatoes and the overall oh, Metacritic yeah. score. <laughs> yeah, um, it's undeniable. This movie is way, way better than it's given credit it's for. It's way smart. It's way funny. It's way dark. I mean, um, this this should have. I mean, if we're being honest here. This should have a Rotten Tomato score in the mid '90s, probably. I mean, I could see it being a divisive movie and having like a 75 or something, right. and feeling like it got robbed a little bit. That I would feel. But I'm though, saying, like in a just world, yeah, this would be an 85, 90 movie. Easy. Yeah, it, it, I think it's up there. I think this is a, you know, this is to me like this should be in contention for being called a fucking classic because I can't think of another movie like it. In my mind, it I is. remember so many scenes from it. I remember Will, Robin Williams singing, like, the rhino is a Nazi. I remember all that shit, you know? He is great in this movie, man. They let Robin Williams... Because, you know, if you look at Robin Williams' old... That's another thing. This is a fucking lost, great Robin yeah. Williams Because they really turn. homogenized Robin Williams in the 80s and 90s. He was a fucking wild man in his comedy days. Yeah, he was... He suffered the fate of the characters right. in this fucking film. Exactly. 
he was vulgar and and all of that stuff. And this film, like, I, you could tell too that he was vibrating for this character. I mean, like, it's one of his best performances, easily. He connected so much with Rainbow Randolph and the nasty, uh, you know, just misanthropic attitude that he had and the self-serving, sociopathic nature with which he dealt with people. Like, Robin Williams plays that with a plum in this movie, and it's so fucking great to watch. It's a great, it's one of the lost great performances of Robin Williams. So many people haven't seen this movie. And it's just it's a shocking. shame. Yeah. So many people that cried when he was, you know, when he died and stuff, never, they missed this. They slept on this movie. And it's it's such a side of Robin Williams that people, I think, deserve to see. Because he was made into 2% milk. You know, and a lot of those movies are really good. I'm not trying to shit on Mrs. Doubtfire. He, he made that movie a gem. Yeah. Totally. Just by his, just simply with his presence. Now, a lot of movies. You take Robin save, Williams but... out of that movie and that's, it's a shit fuck. Miss Do- yeah, Mrs. Doubtfire ain't shit, dude. No, that, that's There's a nobody mo- that could have done totally that movie. Well, I was a him. kid, and I mean, maybe Martin Lawrence. You say Big Mama's house? You guys see Big Mama's house? Get the fuck the out! Big of the Big Mama's house trilogy. No. Get the fuck out of here, TJ. Get, out of here, Get TJ. the fuck! I should have put that room. on here because that's a really. Um, I think it's the great underrated trilogy of our time. Underrated. The Big fuck Mama's yeah. house trilogy. Fucking kill yourself, TJ. Jesus. Underrated, TJ. Come on, come on. That's fucking. Crazy. All right, so last. Uh, I totally agree. This is an underrated film. Last pick on my list. Uh, I've always had, and I mean, it was. I didn't want to do two horror movies, but I ended up doing two horror movies. Uh, <laughs> Bride of Chucky. Boo. Chucky gets lucky. Boo. I think it's an underrated movie. Jennifer Tilly's presence alone in this film is enough for me to give it a fucking hard pass. What do you got against Jennifer Tilly? I hate her you voice. You hate big titties? And- I, I know that there are some... What? I know that there are some women out there that genuinely have voices like that. I'm triggered by it, and it's yes. a personal thing. I yes. have a stepmother... She wasn't a wicked stepmother. She's a very nice lady, but she spoke like that. See, I like, oh, she's greater uh, okay. on me. I really like her voice, and it makes me just want to fuck her more. So, really? Paul, yeah. No. If Sigmund I love that Freud movie. set you down on a couch, dude, all right, but he look, say it's your repressed sexual feelings for your stepmother. Dude. Let's wow. talk about. I don't think so. Let's talk about the merits of this fucking <laughs> film beyond Jennifer Tilly's fucking all right, voice and whatever right, divisive things you have Next about that. Next movie, full stop. Jennifer Tilly. All right, so let me tell you. Let me tell you. Okay, so IMDb five point seven. All right. Uh, Rotten Tomatoes, 39%. Metacritic, 33%. That's um, a pretty panned fair. film. Now, look, I'm not going to argue that this movie should be anywhere in the fucking 90s or the 80s or maybe even the 70s. But I think it deserves a spot in the fucking 60s All on right. Rotten Tomatoes. That's, I mean, you're almost arguing that it should be the lower end of... of I'm, th- I'm saying it should be considered... A decently watchable film, and here's why I uh, think that. I don't know if I agree with that. This is Look, not a very good. I'm not talking about. I'm not I'll, talking I'll, about. I'll, C, I'll I'm out. not talking about C to Chucky all here. Right, all right, okay. a film I would also defend. By the way, of course, but go ahead. But, but everyone hates that You're except just for a me. Chucky fetishist. I, no, you know what? I don't like Cult of Chucky. I thought it sucked. Cult of Chucky, I like. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> everyone likes that one. I think it's a shit. Wow. Look, this movie. By the time this movie came out. They understood no one's taking Chucky seriously as a fucking horror threat anymore. Which happens to all of these horror franchises. It happens to all of them. Freddy got funny. Jason Jason never really got funny. Kind of started. He got a little silly and silly though. He did get a little silly, especially with Jason. Never got silly. Well, I don't know. Did you see the one where he fought Buster? Okay, H two O. Never mind. I forgot about H two O. Well, that was after H two O. It got even worse after H two O. But whatever. Anyway, a lot of these characters go through that. I think Chucky handles it the least embarrassingly because he was something that never should have been taken that seriously to fucking begin with. Mm, I disagree. I think in one movie it worked. I think in the first film it worked. It, by the time the second movie came along, he was no longer even remotely fucking scary. Now look, as a kid, I saw a scene from the second Chucky movie and freaked out. So obviously it can work on that level when you're surrounded by dolls and you're a kid with an overactive imagination. Right. But to adults, it makes very little sense to be scared of fucking Chucky. Um, I guess all these supernatural beings you could say that about, but whatever. He's a doll. He's a living, crazy doll with a foul mouth. He's kind of... It kind of he's he, a serial fits, killer trapped, right, in, trapped a doll. in a doll, which the premise already works as a comedy, I feel like. Uh, so this movie just says, fuck it. It's a comedy now. And it doesn't go crazy with it. It's still a horror movie. There's still some really gruesome fucking kills in this movie. Yes. There's still some people being chopped up by... It wouldn't be a Chucky movie, right. though, if there weren't. Right, and it doesn't back away from that. It maintains the horror of it. You still have the classic Chucky character and voice. It doesn't compromise him as a character. 
mm-hmm. to get the laughs. I mean, it just presents it in a different context. But in a slew of other Chucky films, isn't it kind of just another forgettable entry? I mean, I'm sorry, but it's just a very forgettable film. Like I've seen this movie, but I couldn't fly from it. If you if you paid me a million dollars, I couldn't tell you. What the All right, I'll tell you about. tons of. Se- I haven't seen it in years, and I'll tell you tons of scenes. Okay, from well, because go ahead. Cause I, I can tell you. When I've the, seen it once, maybe with you, but I don't. A not lot remember. of it centers around a road trip. Uh, okay. There's. Uh, Chucky is committing all these murders on the road and the couple who's taking Chucky across the country with them is pretty much none the wiser that's happening. And so they're being framed for these murders and the authorities are on their trail and they're blissfully unaware of it as Chucky is just amassing a huge kill count across America. Uh, finally, they're the gay best friend character and they're a couple who is eloping together against the wishes of their parents and shit. Uh, their gay friend finds uh, some some tr- murder trophy somewhere. Realizes that they're killed. That well, he thinks that they're the killers. I remember him getting smashed by a fucking truck in a scene of just his body liquefying into total gore. Those are always cool. All yeah. of the and look, there's tons like of somebody pretty cool. gets, somebody gets <laughs> there is so hard that they just turn to a look, bag of liquid. Chucky's got some great lines in this. Such Jennifer as. Tilly, even if you don't like her, has got some great like. Oh, I'll give you a great, a great Chucky line from All the right, movie. Just before he dies, he says to, he's he's standing over a grave that he made someone dig, and there they got him dead to rights with like a shotgun or some shit, and he's like, you know what, fuck you, I'll be back. And he Chucky decides, you know what, fuck it, I don't want to be human again. I'm Chucky, I'm the murdering doll, and that's what I fu- I love being the fucking murdering doll. I'm as famous as this. Fuck you, go ahead and kill me. I'll be back. I always come back. And then he kind of thinks about it for a second. He's like, oh, but dying is such a bitch. And then they blow his fucking chest open with a shotgun and cast him into the fucking grave. There's just so many great scenes in this movie like that. Now, like I said, I'm not arguing for this movie to be in the 90s. I think it's just a pretty decent <laughs> movie that's a little underrated. I don't think it's some lost masterpiece that's not given its proper due Man, as the genius film like that it is. Out. I'm just saying it's Sounds pretty. Like cop out. I'm, you know, what I'm saying I'm saying it's a pretty fucking good right. movie. It's a pretty well, decent entry it, into the fucking Child's I mean, Play franchise. Paul, what, does that not sound to you like a cop out? I mean, here I've heard you out, TJ. Yeah, and and here's my problem with that. <clears throat> I lament to a certain extent when these scary dudes go comic. Now there are there's one scary dude in particular that I think benefited from the introduction of a little bit of comedy, and that's Freddy. Right. But Freddy is on well, his own. He was own. a little jokey from the beginning. He, he was he, a little jokey from the beginning, but a little bit more. Most of people's most memorable I'm moments kill you, about bitch. Freddy are when they f- allowed Robert England to just go full blown. He's a you know foul mouthed and he's jokey yes. and he's punny. Oh, it's, it's it's beautiful then. That doesn't work for a lot of these though, and I disagree with one fundamental thing. And you said it very very fucking early, and I kept my mouth shut. Okay. You said that he's already not fundamentally scary. He's already fundamentally jokey. I don't think that's the case with Chucky. I think that the idea of a child's toy coming to life and being inhabited by a serial killer and mm-hmm. stalking a family is inherently scary. And I think by this time, they had just run out of ways to do that creatively, and they decided to hire Jennifer Tilly and make another doll and interject a fucking bunch of comedy into the series instead of sticking to the fundamental point of trying to find ways of making Chucky scary. Right. Right. I think that's probably where uh, where people get divided on this film because it's either you think the comedy angle works for Chucky, which I do, or you just think it doesn't well, work, here's which the thing. you don't. I liked the comedy in Cult of Chucky. I thought that the reason I liked that is because I thought it found a pretty good marriage between this totally jokey yeah. action film Chucky right, and the scary Chucky of old. There was yeah. some genuinely disturbing scenes in there. There were actually some See, genuinely it's, heart-wrenching scenes It's weird scenes because for me... I can. I like the scary Chucky. I like the funny Chucky. I don't really like. Wh- I don't really like the middle ground where they kind of tried to. It's a little bit in each <laughs> camp. I, I don't know. I feel like this one. So Paul likes the balance, but you like that. You like them to commit look, fully to. I, I think like comedy Chucky's or, character I think is best embodied by that balance. Make it a fucking comedy. Make it a fucking straight up horror movie. Because well, Chucky is kind of absurd, even if it is I mean, terrifying. Look, it is kind of absurd. Chucky is, Chucky is absurd. If you watch yeah. the child's play movies as yeah. an adult now, if you're not it's someone a, who's easily scared, you're kind of you're like probably uh, going to think it's funny. There's scene I mean, look, yeah. I'll tell you what, there's a scene in the original child's play that is genuinely scary even to this day to me. And it's the scene where uh, the mother 
is trying to figure out if he's really alive or not. Right. And she's about to throw him in the fire. She's like, I'm going to throw you in the fucking fire if you don't show me some sign that you're, you're actually alive. And the doll just goes absolutely batshit insane in her hands. Yeah. And it wasn't like subtle. It was just like from zero to a hundred like that. And it's fucking genuinely a terrifying well, moment. It, the problem yeah. with Chucky, like, what you're really saying is that once the novelty factor wears off, there's really just not much substance there. And I think that's really what this movie suffers from is that. And I think that's Paul's getting at. It's like Paul's like uh, when they balance those things out, then lack of substance doesn't hurt the movie as much. This is just a lack of substance. I feel like they did some pretty great. Look, maybe going the comedy angle with Chucky is the wrong decision. But even as a wrong decision, I feel like they did a pretty goddamn good job of it in this movie. Uh, there's, I remember it's not hilariously funny like planes, trains, and automobiles or something. But you know, I remember having some good laughs at the fucking film, and also enjoying. The gore element that's perpetually there and enjoying the Chucky performance that's always been good throughout every single iteration of the character <coughs> uh, ever portrayed by Brad Dourif. Uh, so I don't know. I really like the movie. I don't think it deserves to be uh, a, 40, uh, a 46 well, we, or a 48. Can we see some of the uh, criticisms of the film? Sure. Yeah. I mean, they're all... I mean, it's just... It's the same criticisms you see sure. of all the fucking. But, I mean, we already we did it from all the other films. So Grizzly think. tongue and cheek sequel isn't for kids. No shit. Well, fuck yeah. I mean, no it's like, shit. It's just shit like that. Every it's Chucky t- movie. Yeah, I mean, what do you want? How about this? Feels more like a parody of these movies than an actual extension of the world established in part uh, one. Yeah, it kind of I mean, is. That's yeah. what. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that was the intent. Uh, redundant and more than a little wearisome. I mean, I guess if that's how you want to approach it. I, mean, I don't know. I don't know that I would call it redundant or wearisome. I just don't like the. Yeah, I mean, look, Paul's criticisms are better than any of these fucks' criticisms. Yeah, so just kind of. So fuck the this. Anyway, it's time for speaking of Paul. It's time to get into his films. Yeah, cool. Get these uh, middling picks out of the way. Sure thing, Paul. Let's sure talk thing. about the real <coughs> list. <coughs> so Hannibal. This- yeah, the first poor pick Hannibal. Hannibal. Yeah, let me just go ahead and quickly break Hannibal down the Hannibal, uh, the, uh, the IMDb scores and stuff, and then Give I'll set you us. loose. Uh, IMDb on Hannibal six point eight, respectable, mm-hmm. respectable score. Uh, about the score you'd expect to see on uh, a, a pretty decent movie, right? Thirty nine percent on Rotten Tomatoes, which is a dismal score. Yep. Uh, fifty seven on Metacritic, which is uh, yeah, pretty, kind pretty of a middling middling score. score. Yeah. yeah, not not great, but not hideous. They're totally wrong. But I base like my here. my picking of this movie not on what the critics have said. It doesn't surprise me to see the disparity in those scores and to, to, for for me to think that they were all low. Because when I talk to people about this movie, I often find a person that just didn't like it. And almost all the time they can't put their finger on why they didn't like it. And I've narrowed it down. It is a movie that is called Hannibal. You can see the poster of it here has a picture of the character Anthony Hopkins plays in this uh, series of movies, Hannibal po- Lecter. Even though it's simplistic, it's a great poster. It's a great poster, but I think people feel cheated when they watch Hannibal because you know what? There's not a whole lot of Hannibal in Hannibal. That is true. Hannibal is a story about all these other crazy flawed and fragmented characters from Hannibal's past, past victims of his that managed to escape horribly, horribly disfigured. Different characters from the aftermath of Hannibal's horrible, horrible spree of killings. We do get to see Hannibal, but very little of him. Um, The story is more focused on the investigation of Hannibal and his crimes and what what he's left in his path. And that's why I love it. We do get to see a lot of Hannibal, though. I mean, it's not like you do. I'm not saying he's totally absent from the film. It's not like he's, you know, barely in it. I mean, he's maybe not in it as much as you'd think as a titular character. who's so For this this poster (laughs) and to go as far as to name it Hannibal. Right. You're selling it on Hannibal Lecter. I Clearly. think that people felt cheated walking out of that audience. I do feel as well that there was, a, a, you know, I feel like the character was treated a little bit less seriously in this movie. Like, you know, there was all Hannibal was always a witty, intelligent guy, but I feel like there was way more of a like, 
wink, wink, nudge, nudge thing going on between him and the audience in this movie than there ever was in Silence of the Lambs. Like, it kind of feels like he's, he never directly breaks the fourth wall, but he says a lot of things that feel like it's for the benefit of a hypothetical audience out there somewhere. Oh, like, like, like that, like, you know, the scene where he gives the kid the brains and shit like that. Yeah, I mean, like, like, it's kind of like, well, he was making a speech to, he was was talking to Clarice at that time, at least, but like, there's a lot of times where he does like little witty one-liners before killing people and shit like freddy or some shit he's that way it makes him a little bit more like into a slasher whereas in the first movie he felt like he was a little bit above just your garden variety slasher movie villain i still feel like you have that with this film you don't get to see hannibal in his natural environment in the first film at all we are in we are introduced to an utterly subdued version of Hannibal Lecter, a man that has been reduced to a padded cell right. and paintings as long as he goes along with whatever but, he's told. Yeah, Well, I feel like, though, we do see the unrestrained Hannibal at the end of the movie during his big escape sequence. And we I get don't, a glimpse. I don't think that the Hannibal in this movie measures up to the Hannibal we saw at the end of Silence of the Lambs. I think that's a big part of the reason why it... Like, Hannibal doesn't... The, the coolest thing that I remember him doing in the movie was, uh, you know, gutting that uh, detective that was on yeah, his kill, trail. Right. Yeah, he basically and kills hanging, him. hanging him in such a way that it also guts him at the same right. time. And, and that was a brutal. the historical significance yeah. of that. Yeah, and that being his ancestor and all that stuff. Right. That was b- a really awesome, really brutal scene. But I don't think that it matches for me Hannibal bludgeoning those guards to death and then... Flame. Peacefully enjoying that that record at the end. Oh, that, that is that operatic right. music, and See, he's here's just killing the them. And yeah. that is why people felt cheated by this film. Because even though we do get to see quite a bit of Hannibal, we see him in an environment that we're unfamiliar with, and we don't like what Ridley Scott and the writers of this film do with Hannibal Lecter in the wild. I don't mind seeing that side of Hannibal Lecter. Right. Um. I do happen to think he's portrayed better in the wild in Red Dragon in the earlier scenes than that where he's dealing with... uh, Even though at that point you have to believe that Hannibal literally ages in reverse. Right. But you have to to understand that's a different Hannibal too. This is a Hannibal that's escaped custody and is one of the most wanted men in the world. Not a comfortable... He's really not sweating it too much though. He's he's working as a museum curator. He's a comfortable psychopath. Yes, exactly. He's manipulative. He knows how to get out of town and become Mm -hmm. something else. He's obviously the character super brilliant. I, I don't... I don't think the portrayal of Hannibal in this movie is at all bad. And that's not what I'm saying. I'm (laughs) just saying that I think that the Hannibal they get in this movie is just ever so slightly, like maybe 10% less than what you got in Silence of the Lambs. And I think people maybe feel that to some extent. Like, "Ah, it just doesn't feel quite right. Or maybe for some people it's worse than that. I don't know. But here's the thing. And you're always going to have this. When Silence of the Lambs... And Anthony Hopkins' portrayal of Hannibal Lecter, it's like, you have the novelty factor. You've never seen this trick before. And he's such a fucking memorable villain. I mean, even though, I mean, he's not even the main villain of the film, but he's such a memorable character. And he's only on screen for like 15 minutes. Right. So with this, it feels like, I know what people were expecting. They were expecting to come into this. This is all about Hannibal. Right. That, 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 that's, it. that's it. And obviously and he's the main focus. focus is way more on all the fucked yeah, up people chasing Starling, him. Starling. Right. You know, it's on a lot of other, there's other little subplots. Mason, Ver- like, look, this, this, um... Uh, has another flaw here, this poster that we're looking at. Because it, it puts Anthony Hopkins, who, who I agree needs to be up there, and Julianne Moore. There should also be Gary Oldman Correct. on this. And in my opinion, TJ might not like this. Ray Liotta as well should be <laughs> billed in this movie. No, he, he, he's good in this. Their performances are fucking absolutely amazing. In fact, directly, Gary Oldman's performance as Mason Verger the weird, twisted, rich billionaire oh, victim of Hannibal who had his face sliced off and was horribly eviscerated but managed to survive. Didn't he even not take a credit for this movie? Um, I don't know. I believe he didn't. Um, I his performance he in this movie is the most memorable thing about despite it. Despite playing a <laughs> main character and doing it very well. He, he um, manages to play a victim in a way that... Yeah, makes you still despise him. Right. Show you that not all victims are great people, and 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 that at the end of the day, what a victim becomes is often a dark thing. Mason Verger is the best part of this movie, and it's the reason why I think it deserves a way better score than it does. His performance alone in this movie is worth watching it for, and that's pretty rare amongst movies for me. But for some reason, I'll, I, I just cannot forget that performance, that central performance. Yeah, 
Oh, it's it's unforgettable. I mean, uh, it, no, I mean I don't. This is another, when you first meet the character too, that, that I mean, that's a great scene. Like, and they turn the lights up so you can actually get a kind of good good look at him and like his visage, uh, and you're kind of just like, what the fuck? Yeah, I tried to play a little devil's advocate with it, but honestly, like thirty nine percent is a fucking slap. It's in the abysmal, face. man. I mean, that's a slap that's in the face of a movie that's egregious. That just, yeah, this movie deserves much better treatment than that. I mean, if Ridley Scott directing the film, I believe. Let's hear what they got to say. These and, fucking and the visuals of, shit of the movie critics. are great. Uh, let's see. I keep wanting to see Ebert here. Come on, Ebert. You were still alive when this came out, weren't you? You fuck. And maybe he scrubbed that from history like so many of his other shit reviews. <laughs> Hannibal doesn't seem to be about anything but its own swank decadence. Hopkins, with his reedy voice and a feet airs, is still quite delicious in the part that won him an Oscar. But ten years later, Lecter has become more camp than terrifying. Hell, you were getting that, TJ. Yeah, I think that there was... I mean, yeah, it was a little campy. I don't know. Man. I don't. I, I don't. Know, I, don't I wouldn't go full on with this guy's sentiments. I don't but know if Lecter has been explored enough at this time and through the movies to that for the determination to really be made. Well, the problem is, is that there's. I, I know. I, that I, think, I, don't know. I feel like he was. I mean, he, he was pretty defined by his Academy Award winning performance in Silence of the Fucking Lambs. I mean, you can't say like, oh, he was some undeveloped but, but, character but under a different condition. He won a fucking Oscar for that fucking movie. Well, he, very little screen time. I'm not. And I'm not saying that the character maybe as a whole is underdeveloped. I mean, like. That the nuances of the character. How, how do you know the character wouldn't say those right, things? Right. Yeah. How, let me ask you this about. This I mean, movie. How, how can you say he's not tongue in cheek? Because I think we've talked to death about that. But what do you think about uh, Julianne Moore replacing uh, Jodie Foster? Uh, for it this? had to be done, and I think that she was a good selection for the part. But Starling is a an incredibly different character in this movie. Uh, than she yeah, is. that's kind of how I felt too. Uh, and it's a bold. It's kind of a bold move because they could not like Jodie Foster wouldn't. They couldn't get her or whatever. It just right, didn't work she out. Wouldn't do she, it. she turned it down. Down, and they had to they, they had this movie that was based around this previously established relationship between Lecter and one of his investigators and instead of trying to hire somebody and have them do a Clarice Starling impersonation they upped their ante and I guess maybe banking on the fact that some years had passed and that Starling had gotten more professional and more confident because what we get in Hannibal uh, in Julianne Moore's performance is a far more confident uh, more capable, I think, more ready to step into the shoes of a lead investigator, uh, Clarice Starling. And maybe a lot of people didn't like that as well. Maybe they wanted her to remain the kind of demure, assertive only when she absolutely has to be uh, understated performance that they got from uh, the the first film. Right. Uh, I, I just I wonder if um, I wonder if it had something to do with these low scores, though, just like, hey, you know, I know not- it did. I'm not really sure about this new Clarice because I feel cheated by the changes that they have had to made to keep this story going, and thus the movie is shit. That's what I feel most people feel about this movie, right? At least the ones that I mean, I've you have to, to admit that a bad cast. I don't. I'm not saying she's a bad casting choice. I'm saying, but is, I'm, but yeah. I'm saying that a bad casting choice for a particular character, especially an established one who's been played by someone else, can Absolutely. be a, a that can sink a ship. I just for sure. don't think that's the case here, right? Enough time has passed. Do you think that there's films. enough? Th- you, you think there's enough there that that opinion would be valid in your mind if yeah, someone else were to have it? Mm, I mean, on a cursory watch of this film, I guess so. If you just came there hoping that, and I don't blame you if you came to this movie looking at the fucking promotional materials for it. I mean, it's just sold as hey, a deeper, better look at Hannibal, and really, it, it, it's not. It's really not what people wanted. And I think that that has caused them to, a lot of people to just dismiss it out of hand. And on multiple watches of this film, I felt that way the first time I watched Hannibal. Right. But uh, I was actually pretty happy with it the first time I saw it. And, I, uh, I, I walked out of I, feeling slightly cheated by it. And because it's really, it's not as good a film as The Silence of the Lions. No, it's definitely not. No. No, no definitely. It doesn't rise to that. I don't, I don't, and so I think I people I, felt cheated by that. But I I think a lot of I mean, the for, greatness I mean, like, in look, this movie. Look, for a fucking sequel to a. Oscar winning <laughs> multiple Oscar winning film I feel like it's pretty goddamn good I agree I mean and so is Red Dragon the whole little uh trilogy with uh Anthony Hopkins playing Hannibal Lecter is a fucking so- it's solid well Red Dragon puts Hannibal Lecter back in his familiar place 
Yeah. And I think that people receive but Red a very, Dragon way better than they receive a this A very film. different relationship, though, between his character and Edward Norton's character than, than his and Clarice's. Oh, yeah, because Edward Norton's character is a far more assertive. He's a veteran investigator rather than Not a only that, but he's Academy also he's, he's more responsible. In, he's more in Hannibal's head, too. Right. He's more capable. Yeah, um, I I, uh, I really enjoy the trilogy, and I think this one is unfairly panned, especially by Rotten Tomatoes. Boo for the fucking thirty nine percent on this. Yeah, terrible. That's a brain dead fucking rating for this. Uh, the IMDb score, it's on the high end, honestly. I mean, like, not, I don't think it's not so, awful, but it's not awful. Yeah, I would give this a seven five at eight. six point eight. It's definitely got its defenders. And I'd the probably, Metacritic score, I think, is way too. It middling. seems like I'd feel comfortable putting it around <coughs> a seven and a half myself. I, I think it's weighed down, but just by audience expectation, I think critically. They're just reflecting that in the audience that they're they're coming to this film expecting to be about Hannibal Lecter, and when you don't deliver on that premise, you're just gonna get a lot of unhappy people. All right, we're gonna get to Paul's next <laughs> film, but first, I actually need I, I forgot to do this at the time uh, to give you the averages for uh, my uh, list. Sure. Oh, sure. Because um, which was once again Friday the Thirteenth Part Seven, Death to Smoochie, and Bride of Chucky. So the com- the average IMDb score of those films is five point seven. The average Rotten Tomato score is 39, and the average uh, Metacritic score is 33. Pretty low. Uh, Scotty's, once again, were IMDb 7.1, uh, Rotten Tomatoes 49%, and uh, Metacritic 47. So, uh, Paul, with that being in mind, uh, we're going to go to net your next yeah. uh, film. Let's get rid of all these horror movies. Let's this go. This is a uh, film called The Last Dragon, which uh, the first film on this list to come up that I have not yeah, myself I seen. I have not seen this as well. Wow. So, uh, Paul, you're going to be kind of, I don't know, I, I don't even know how to vamp on this, so we're just going to probably <laughs> go through fine. it kind of quick. Uh, so what is, what is la- The Last so Dragon? IMDb uh, is 6.9. Yeah. Rotten Tomatoes is 59%, and Metacritic does not have any reviews of it. Let me ask you a question, guys, then, since you've never seen this movie. You like kung fu movies? Yep. Yep. Do you like slapstick comedies? Mm, not yeah, so much. Yeah, sometimes. Scotty, not so much. You sometimes, depending on. Yeah, Do you depending. like action films? Yes. Yes. Yes and yes. Do you like black exploitation cinema? Uh, somewhat. No. Wink, wink. Yeah, I do, actually. I love yeah. it. Yeah. This is a mishmash of all of those genres into one insanely over-the-top, Reveling in its own stupidity and looking good while doing it. Stylish 80s kung fu disaster of a fucking film. And I love it. And I've loved it since I was a little kid. How does it uh, co- how does it compare to something like Black Dynamite, if you've seen that? It is not. It's not like that. Okay. The lead character in this film, in fact, is the opposite of Black Dynamite. He is a nerd. The guy you see in the center of the film is Leroy. He's the lead character in this movie, and he's basically a weeaboo. He is a black man raised in the inner city who has decided to adopt the mentality and training and lifestyle of a kung fu master under the tutelage of a a kung fu teacher. Cool. And he talks with an Asian affectation, (laughs) and he walks around the entire movie wearing that little Asian getup with the weird white buttons and the sandals and the hat. You know what I mean? Yeah. He actually, he's a full-blown weeb. And he's a dork, and everybody makes fun of him. He's busted on by everybody in the community, obviously, because they're all dressing hip and walking around with boom boxes with hip hop, and he's shuffling around in wooden block shoes, you know? So it's definitely an inversion of that. Um, the villain in the film, though, is very black exploitation. You can see him in the back holding up his hands yeah. menacingly. Looks like a black pie may kind of. Yeah, his name is Show Nuff in this. <laughs> Show <laughs> Nuff. He has a great chant that he makes his gang do. He says, Who's the baddest? And they say, Show Nuff. Who's the meanest? Show Nuff. Who's the lowest down scummy fuck in this town or whatever? And they say, Show Nuff. And then he goes, you damn right. <laughs> so he's definitely That's awesome. the shaft of this film. All right, film. so I already agree that this movie's underrated <laughs> based on what you said. You've, um, you've sold this movie to me. There's a subplot in this movie that you can also see here uh, displayed on the, um, on the poster. The white guy uh, in the background and the girl. Um, there's a love subplot that involves Leroy falling in love with this girl who's, uh, you know, a TV. She's a TV personality in the local town that and she runs like one of those like dance shows that were popular back in the 70s and 80s. You remember like Soul Train or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something like she's, that. She's like the, the lead of one of the, the, the host of one of those. Leroy's in love with her. 
show enough is in love with her. And this white guy behind her is her horribly like corrupt white racist manager who's constantly trying to uh, undermine her career to get his wife, who's devoid of any talent, looks, or ability, in her position. <laughs> um, so it's great. It's Like I said, there's a lot of slapsticky comedy to it. The culmination of it is, before he's killed tragically early in the film, Leroy's kung fu master tells him about the glow, which is supposedly this ancient martial arts technique that you can tap into if you harness enough of your inner power. And uh, the last battle in the film involve him having developed the power to have the glow, but then Shonuff reveals that he himself has tapped into the dark side of the glow, and he's got the red glow. Damn. So you get this badass kung fu fight with all these 80s laser effects on him. Everybody's exploding with color and shit. It's a badass movie. It's way underrated and underwatched and under-talked about because it's such a mishmash of genres. And that's why it's on this list. So let's, uh, since obviously me and Scotty can't offer any resistance to you, let's see if we can find some critics who panned this. Uh, now, a lot of critics did like it. Uh, so let's see. AKA Barry Gordy's The Last Dragon, and a sure sign that somewhere along the way, the man from Hitsville, USA, lost it badly. Oh, look, a Roger Ebert. All right, oh, well, here's your oh, enemy. Oh, so let's go. Let's read your enemy. Two and a half. He didn't totally pan it. No. Uh, blah blah blah. Well, let's just read his uh, his caption here because I, I don't have time to go through that whole fucking thing. It's so entertaining that I could almost recommend it if it weren't for an idiotic subplot about a gangster and his girlfriend, a diversion that brings the movie to a dead halt every eight or nine minutes. Boo! So wrong. The subplot is fun. The whole movie is fun. Roger Ebert sucks. I mean, it's always sound like people are too down on this film, though. Like, like even Roger Ebert's criticism. Yeah, he, is, I mean, he's saying it's at least, kind of like he's saying it's entertaining. There's a caveat least. to it. It's like right. this, the main story is entertaining. The subplot sucks. He just didn't care for the subplot. So Michael Schultz tries hard, but can't quite manage to tie the varied elements of action, romance, comedy, and musical video together. Though as entertainment, this is engaging enough. See, so yeah, it looks like Luke, uh, even uh, these people giving it negative reviews have got to begrudgingly they're kind of like, a little which respect. So. I think sucks that they felt. Like a movie that entertained them deserved a negative yeah, like, review. It, to me, what what purpose does a film? I mean, obviously, movies can make you think and all that other shit. But ultimately, the purpose of a movie is to entertain. So, if a movie entertained you, how the fuck are you going to give it a yeah. negative review? You don't got to give it a glowing like this is the finest thing ever. But at least ha like have acknowledge a that it did its fucking it. job Look, as a movie. Felix is back. He says, "Say what you want about it, but I still love it." There you go, Paul. Well, all right, Felix Vasquez, I agree with you on this one. There's probably a lot of nostalgia for this one. A lot of these people probably watched this movie when they were younger, like I did. I know I started watching it when I was before 10, like, it so seems like thrust, seven, eight years old. It seems the thrust of the criticism of the film is just that there's so many disparate elements that it doesn't bring it all together. That's really, it seems like the thing. But most people, I haven't really, from these ones, I haven't really seen one say it's just outright shit. Right. It just doesn't, it just doesn't deliver on the premise. Yeah. I believe that uh, it's definitely... Oh, dude, listen to this fucking review, dude. Okay. It is crammed with kung fu, <laughs> singing, rapping, dancing, and video art. And no moment goes by without at least three oh, of those things transpiring like simultaneously. Janet Maslin sounds like a pretentious wow. piece of shit. What a fart. That's so that. horrible. Oh, no. Different entertainment things happening to me all at once. It just sounds what like... What a nightmare. This was too boundary-breaking for a lot of stuffy, <laughs> whiny fucks, basically. Uh, yeah. There's some fucking songs in this movie. Like, it's an 80s movie, so there's some, like, 80s pop songs that are featured in music video form that are probably haven't aged well. So if I had to give it a critique, it was that it relied too heavily on what the popular music sounded like at the time for it to be really, truly timeless in that way. But other than that, I couldn't recommend this movie highly enough. If you like any of those things I mentioned at the very beginning, kung fu, slapstick comedy, just normal, you know, kind of goofy comedy, action, uh, you know, a little romance subplot thrown in there. If you like all those things or any of those things, is worth looking at. Faux show. But I tell you what, TJ, <laughs> there's only one man sitting here on the deep fat fried dais uh -huh. that had the balls. <laughs> To pick a really, truly shit film and put it on this list, TJ. Yeah. Everybody middled. Oh, you know, it's well, not you weren't great. supposed to put shit films. You're supposed to it's put... TJ. All right. You're not letting me finish, TJ. 
This is mom and dad save the world. An epic adventure from the 90s. Give them the scores, TJ. IMDb 5.3. Ooh. Which is tied for the lowest movie score here with my pick of Friday the 13th, yes. part 7. However, uh, your movie underperforms Friday the 13th, part 7 which has a Rotten Tomato of 29%. This movie only has 9%. This is the rottenest movie on the list. And once again, you've picked a movie with no Metacritic score. So only one of your movies had a Metacritic score. Yeah. Boldly going where no parents have gone before. This film is shit. <laughs> it is absurd from start to finish. Crammed with jokes that don't make sense. Filled to the brim with silly, over-the-top performances. And really kind of goofy, practical effects. It takes place on a tiny planet ruled by a tiny dictator. John Lovitz is given more screen time than any character in this film. John Lovitz! And I still put it on this list, TJ. You know why? Why? Because it revels in being those things. This movie knew it was shit from the get-go. And they decided to be the most shit that they could be. And they succeeded, and it's great. It's great entertainment from start to finish. I giggle my ass off thinking about this movie. There are heart-wrenching moments in this movie that make me that make me sad. You remember when he's being tortured and he keeps begging for his wife? He's, Marge! <laughs> oh, Marge! TJ, a tear formed in my eye. It did not. And yours you know as well. No, it is, did dude. not. You know what this is? This is Paul pa trolling pa this list. No. No, it's not. No. Yes. No, it's not. I will not be called a troll. No, I, I, I don't actually believe Paul's trolling. You know what I believe it is? What? Paul fucking saw this shit as a kid. Yes. And this is, it, this is a big fucking nostalgia bummer because when he was a kid and he had no sense, he liked this and was like, this is a good movie. Like a little Paul, like six, six years old, crying like, oh my God, it's a wonderful movie. Then he grows up and every once in a while, like, Paul will just be sitting around just thinking about a movie. He's like, Mom and Dad saved the world. Yeah, it's not. Dude, and Paul is a lover of schlock. So you have to take Paul I, do, I am that. He is someone that just like schlock informed him in his life. He's one of those people. He saw a bad movie. Instead of everyone going, that sucks. Paul's a contrary into the corner. He's like, you know what? I don't think that movie sucks. Here's why it's actually good. Mom and Dad saved the world, which was directed by Greg Beeman. <laughs> and has Greg Seaman <laughs> and has the scraggly feel of an extended Saturday Night Live skit boasts unusually inspired production design boo fuck him the production design on this movie is great well that's what he said unusually inspired production design he's saying it's good oh, okay, despite good. the fact that the movie feels like a boo, terrible boo damn Paul okay Saturday sorry Night I just <laughs> thought it was all negative <laughs> see another one where they got a sit down Paul it. Sit me down. Mom and Dad Save the World is an insult to the idea of children's Damn. entertainment. Damn. Shots it's fired. It's not even children's entertainment. I mean, it was targeted It's dirty. Kids. It's got dirty jokes and shit all woven throughout oh, Paul, it. Paul, you're really going to hate this one. Here's a novel idea. A kid's movie with the parents as heroes. That that twist is the most, some might say only, refreshing element in Mom and Dad Save the World. Yet another overwrought but uninspired fantasy in which all the wit is in the amusing stylized sets and costumes rather than the script. Wow. Yet another dour piece of shit. All right. Here's one, I, critic. Here's one I definitely agree with because I felt this when we were watching it. It's not too much more interesting than a blank oh. screen. Oh, shut up. <laughs> Fuck you. You know I what, TJ? I drop the fucking mic, Listen, dude. You know what? Paul, I remember this. I remember a sequence of fucking events that Paul right. is emitting from fucking the record here. <laughs> okay, TJ. Okay, okay. Let's hear it. Let's hear this sequence. We were sitting around, and Paul's like, you know what's a good underrated movie? Mm -hmm. Mom and Dad Saved the World. You're, you're remembering another movie. No. Yes. No. You're remembering to Stay Tuned. We, we did it with that, too. We did it with both of these fucking movies. But you know what? We Stay Tuned... It was actually the same, because it was both times we both had fond memories of the fucking movie. We watched Stay Tuned, we realized, hey, Stay Tuned fucking sucks. It was garbage, yeah. As a piece of shit. I agree. We watched this one. No, and you, I don't agree. Stay Tuned has some interesting ideas. It does. And it was okay. dated by its referential humor. That's fine. You know what? Both these movies, I will grant, have interesting premises. Yes. But you know what? Both these movies have shit execution. Neither of them is funny. Both of them feature that weird fucking child molesting Jeffrey Jones or whatever the fuck his name is. Come here, boy. 
I like Jeffrey Jones despite who he may have diddled. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, whatever. Hey, diddle, diddle. He's a funny actor, but whatever. I'm. I'm just throwing I'm not a shade. Me, at I'm this not point. a Me Too guy. You I'm know? gonna play with Paul's little fiddle. He's. A, he's, he's. He's gonna fiddle Paul's little look, balls. He's effective as a as a big no, he's old schlub fine, in this movie. Fine. Yeah. He does and a Terry good job. And he's good. At, he's good as, as a a, he's good as the little servant of the devil in the other movie too. And and as the demon in Howard the Duck. Both those movies are boring as shit. And this movie's boring, and you admitted it was boring at the time, and now a little more time has passed, and you've repressed the memory of any of that to the point where you're like, you're thinking of something else. And now you're right back to calling it underrated. No, no. When you either. already were proven fucking wrong. You're, you might be correct all the way up until that last part. <laughs> that last part. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a departure from the truth. That right last there. part where you're, you are projecting your review of this film onto me, TJ. Dude... I thought that this film was visually interesting all the way through, mm. entertaining and fun. And you know what? I had the balls to put a family film on this list. But you did. there's a subversive thing about this movie that all you right. didn't catch, TJ. What is that? You didn't catch. This is an incisive critique of the fact that the people that run our <coughs> society have all become idiots. They are transported to the little planet of Spango, named after the emperor, Todd Spango, who if you watch this movie, if you don't listen to these naysayers, and you watch this movie, you will see Donald J. Trump written all over Todd Spango's face. This movie predated Trump's candidacy. This movie called the Trump presidency years, decades before it happened. Hmm. Todd Spango uh, will hail, be remembered as an a early hail warning. Mary desperate attempt to tie an early to Trump, Donald warning Trump, for Americans not to allow <laughs> stupidity, <laughs> not to allow ignorance and self-servingness and narcissism to the top of their what, fucking government what, like what Todd a lofty, Spango what a and the lofty planet and Spango. Prescient film I had no idea how what powerful What a lofty, prescient was. fucking film. All right, so he'll How look, absurd, how ridiculous. Uh, That's definitely not what they were going I for. I guess I can go ahead and actually just show you guys this now because uh, there's, no, there's no mystery anymore to it. Um, demystify, TJ. Let's demystify. I'll, I'll tell you one thing. If Paul recommends a movie, you have to know... Unless, you've so heard, check this unless out. you actually know what the movie is, it's probably Final fun. scores for yeah. Paul. Uh, IMDB average, <laughs> 6.3. Okay. Uh, average Rotten Tomato, 36%. Mm -hmm. Well, as far as I'm concerned, the IMDB people know what they're talking uh, his about. His Metacritic doesn't really matter. It's 57, but only because the only movie that yeah, he has. Yeah, I dispute on, that totally. Yeah, so that's really not useful data. Um, so the lowest of the low when it comes to IMDB scores is me. The lowest of the low when it comes to Rotten Tomato scores is Paul. The lowest of the low when it comes to Metacritic scores is me, That's but odd. only because I can't compete with Paul because he his films don't have there's not enough data. Well, at least you admit it. Shut up, Paul. <laughs> I meant, I meant str you know what I meant. I know exactly. You know what exactly. You meant, yeah, you don't. You don't know what I meant. Yeah, never mind. Anyway, so uh, yeah, that's how it breaks down. And look, um, as far as I'm concerned. Every movie here is probably worth at least one watch to decide how the fuck you feel about it. Uh, these are divisive movies, obviously. They're love them or hate them movies. In some cases, we might be the only ones who fucking like them. I think in the case of Mom and Dad Save the World and maybe Friday the 13th Part 7, me and Paul might be the only sole defenders of these fucking I movies. I that's true. But, uh, well, obviously, a bit of exaggeration there. Anyway, thank you guys for watching. And remember, we're going to do a little special Super Bowl thing for patrons. We're going to watch all the stupid Super Bowl commercials and give you our thoughts hooray, because for some reason hooray. that's going to happen. For some reason, you guys like it. Honestly, that's my least favorite episode we've ever done. The people so. disagree, dude. The people want more. Apparently, the people don't feel the same Give as the I do. They want more. Give the people what they want, TJ. We're giving Give it to the, the patrons. What they want. If you're not a patron, sign up for Patreon. You know Become where the fuck it is. See you later. See you later, bitch.